today we are starting with the analysis of flange sections. Uh, this is article 4-8 in the James K. White book. So, so if you consider this floor system, we have these two beams resting on these two column, this beam resting on these two columns and this beam resting on these two columns and slab which is spanning in this direction. It is carrying load in this direction. One way slab carrying load in this direction because we have no supports in this direction. So it cannot transfer load in the opposite direction, in this perpendicular direction. So it transfers or carries load all in this direction. Uh, so the slab is carrying load in this direction to these beams A, B and C, D. And in turn, these beams are transferring this load, this the load to the columns in the other direction. So same goes on this side. Now generally, these columns are constructed first, and once these columns are constructed, they are allowed to gain their strength, and then the slab and the beams are cast monolithically, they are poured monolithically with concrete. So if you can see this picture, you know, the reinforcement for slab and beam has been placed and they will be now poured monolithically. So same concrete will be flowing into this, you know, slab and same into beam. So they will be monolithic. Uh, for this reason, some part of the slab acts integrally with this beam as if it was a part of this beam. So some part of the slab acts as flange for this beam and similarly over here for this beam some part of the slab acts as a flange for this beam. So, so such a beam uh, for which some part of the slab is acting as a, as a flange is referred as T beam because if you look at this shape, this resembles this, the shape of the letter T. And uh, you know, in some for this spandrel beam C D, uh, edge beam is also called spandrel beam. For this beam, there is slab on uh, present on only one side, so there is flange present on only one side. So this is also you can call it T beam, but the more common name to distinguish it from this kind of a beam is inverted L beam because it reflect it is similar in a shape to an inverted inverted L. So make, you may call this as L beam and this as T beam. So you may uh, you may I mean come across such terminologies as T beam and L beam. So this is what we refer uh, this is what we mean by those beams. So T beam and inverted L beam. But the general term T beam sometimes can be used for both of them. Uh, this is how, I mean, what we mean by spindle beam. This is, you know, your general beam, interior beam, and this is the edge beam, so we call it spindle beam. So if you look at the, uh, this is an interior beam supported on columns over here, and it is continuous beyond these columns. So some part of the slab is acting as flange for this beam, so it is, uh, you know, having T-beam action. Now, you know that <clears throat> from structural analysis, you know that at mid span the moment will be positive and at, at the uh, support the moment will be negative. Now, for the positive moment, if you, I mean, if, if for the positive moment, we will be having sagging, which means compression on the top and tension at the, tension at the bottom. So, you see these flexural cracks appearing on the bottom side due to tension on the bottom. So, at this location, compression is on the top. So, this flange will be in compression. Compression will be on the flange side. So, there are two possibilities in this case. Either the neutral axis, the, the compression zone will be completely lying in this flange. And the, the other possibility is that it is extending beyond the flange down to the, into the web. So this is the most common case for compression uh, for such beams, but rarely this case can happen, which where the compression zone will be T-shaped. Most of the times the compression zone is a rectangular compression zone. So, uh, however, for if you look at this uh, this section at BB, where bending moment will be negative, we will be having hogging, which means tension at the top, compression at the bottom. So you see these flexural cracks appearing on the tension side, on the on the top side over here. 
So this side compression zone is definitely a rectangular compression zone. Look at this. This is the compression side. This is the tension side in, in the, at BB location. So of course, this compression zone will be a rectangular zone. So uh, whatever we have discussed so far, it applies to rectangular compression zone. So in, in this, for the negative moment, for section BB, where, which is a negative moment section, the compression zone is always a rectangular compression zone. However, for the mid span, there are two possibilities. Either the compression zone, if it lies completely in the flange, the compression zone is a rectangular compression zone. But in the other possibility, in which you know compression is still on the uh, on the flank side, but the the needle axis is, I mean, the compression zone is extending down into the web, so it becomes a T-shaped compression zone. Uh, now, in a slab system, which has uh, you know slab and then beams under it to support the loading, in such cases, the slab is resting often on relatively lighter beams in this direction and these beams are then resting on these larger beams which are also called girders. So girders are supporting these beams and these beams are supporting the slab. So this is how the load transfer happens and finally the load is transferred to the column. So here also you can see this is an edge beam so we also call it a spindle beam. Uh, so in such case again the all these beams whether these beams are girders these beams are girders, all of them, and the slab. All, all, all of these elements, this girder, this slab, this beam and slab, all of them are poured monolithically, and as a result, the slab acts as, a part of the slab acts as a flange for the girder, as well as for the beam, as well as for the beam. So, same slab acts as flange for the girder, as well as for the beam. Now we are going to answer the question that uh, how much part of this slab should be considered acting integrally with this beam? How much part of the slab should be acting, considered to be acting as a flange for the beam? To answer this question, just consider uh, we have this T-beam made of any material, isolated T-beam. This is not, this is, I mean, an isolated T-beam. This, is, this beam is not a part of uh, of a monolithic slab and beams floor system. This is, a, this is a, I mean, uh, isolated T-beam. There is no extension of any slab over here. This is an isolated one. Let's say it is simply supported. So if you consider it, and if we have, a, um, for example, uniformly distributed load acting over it, and this is just half, half part of the beam. This is, I mean, we have cut a section at the mid span now of course we will be having sagging in this beam so compression at the top tension at the bottom so in this case uh, now if you recall the concept of shear at this location at this cross section we have sufficient bending moment in fact maximum bending moment so resultingly we have uh, you know some compressive stress distribution acting on this flange com in compression and over here the bending moment is zero at this end the bending moment is zero. So if there is no bending moment, the, the flexional compressive stresses will also be zero because sigma is m y over i. So if m is zero, sigma will also be zero. Now, you see, if you consider free body diagram for this flange, I mean this left flange, if you consider free body diagram for this left flange from support up to the mid span, at this cross section, there is some compressive force due to this flexional compressive stress distribution. Over here, the compress the flexible stress distribution is zero. So naturally, there's a net drift acting on this flange. I mean, in this direction, net drift is acting in this direction. Now, how can it? How can this drift be equilibrated? This can be neutralized. This can be uh, balanced if we if the if the beam develops some resisting shear forces or shear stresses acting along this interface between this flange and the rest of the beam i would say the the web so this this area which is in fact this is how the flange is connected to the beam to the rest of the beam so there must be some shear forces acting over here so if you consider the concept of shear flow i mean showing the force as per unit length if you if you i mean show this force as per unit length we call it shear flow and you are familiar with this concept 
So this shear flow must be mobilized. Now, even if this is mobilized, still the beam is not, this flange will not be in equilibrium. Why? Because, because the, the, the summation of forces seems to be now satisfied because net drift is acting in this direction and shear flow is acting in this direction. So summation of forces may be satisfied, but of course, this is not going to produce uh, a net zero moment. So there is a net moment acting on the flange in this direction. Let me show you the direction of that, of that unbalanced moment. This is the direction of that unbalanced moment. Now, we need a counter moment acting in the opposite direction. That counter moment must be able to, to, to cancel the effect of this moment. This moment is due to, I mean, this is acting at this location, maybe somewhere over here, the, the resultant compressive force, and this is the shear flow. So they are not collinear. So they must be producing a bending moment. Uh, so not a bending moment, just a moment acting in this direction. So there is a need of an equi equilibrating moment. That moment is generated by these forces. If you see this transverse compression, and this transverse tension. These forces are, uh, I mean, they are not, they, they are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, but they are capable of producing a moment in this direction, in this blue arrow direction. So this moment, due to these transverse compression and internal compression, uh, transverse compression and transverse tension forces, this is being produced in order so that the flange remains in equilibrium as far as moment equilibrium is concerned. So this is how the whole, uh, I mean, uh, system of forces acting on this, act on this flank. Now, you see, due to this sh shear lag concept, I mean, you have, I, I hope you are familiar with this concept of shear flow, uh, sh shear lag, you know, th this, this arises whenever you transfer, uh, whenever there is a connection between the rest of the element there may be the rest of the beam and one element when you when you see this for this flange the forces are being transferred through this shear force so whenever you transfer forces through shear there is a shear lag phenomenon due to what happens due to that shear lag phenomenon uh, the stress distribution acting on this flange is not uniform. There are higher stresses near the web and lesser stresses as you go far away from the web. Although uh, based on the classical flexural theory, you know, if I talk about just the magnitude, it is given by m by over i. So, you know, in a given, uh, in a given beam, so far what you have learned is that in case of this T beam, uh, if this is the neutral axis and if I want to find sigma at this location from y distance from, from the neutral axis, then since y is same from all for all these fibers located at same distance from y at same depth, you would this theory would tell you that that the that the beam sh that we should have same sigma acting or at uh, acting at this line. I mean same sigma for all fibers on this line. Uh, I mean, this is what the flexural theory would tell you, but in actual, what we have observed in field is, uh, due to shear lag phenomenon, this stress is lesser, and this stress near the web is higher, because we are transferring the force to the flange with, at this, uh, with the help of this, I mean, uh, shear flow acting over here. So whenever there's a, forces are transferred with the help of shear flow, the non-uniform non stress distribution results. You have found this, learned this concept in steel structure when you, have, when you are studying the tension member design. Let me show you a quick example of that. In steel structures, you have learned that if this is the gusset plate and this is a tension member connected to a single angle section and such, the, the gusset plate and uh, the, the angle section are connected only I mean, only one leg of this uh, angle section is connected to the flange, uh, sorry, connected to the gusset plate. And now if you see, we have tensile forces acting on this member, this is the tension member. Now, away from this connection, we have uniform distribution of stress acting on this uh, cross section, no problem over here. But near the connection, 
what happens is that you see we have some compressed uniform some p over a stresses acting uh, uh, uniformly all over this cross section over here so all of this cross section is participating but if you look at this uh, location for the for the vertical flange for the vertical uh, leg of the angle section this angle section over here is no stresses not this this white region is not stressed because right now it is not forces are not yet transferred to this uh, to this angle because actually the lower angle the lower the lower leg is connected to the to the gusset plate so the forces are transferred from the gusset plate with the help of these uh, bolts and since bolts are there only in the lower leg so actually the first the first part of the cross section that gets stressed is the lower lower uh, leg which is connected directly to this uh, gusset with the help of these bolts so initially only this lower leg is stressed and the upper leg remains unstressed but as you go away from the connection area the parts of the so, you know this shaded part this the this part of the leg uh, also starts contributing so as if you go certain distance away from the connection the whole of the vertical leg starts contributing uh, to to the resisting of load so some so over here we have some tensile stresses on, acting on on this side of the uh, on this side but this side is i mean stress free so again there is a net drift acting on this angle in this direction so that drift is then neutralized with the help of shear flow generated at the uh, at the connection of i mean at the interface of the vertical and horizontal leg and this shear flow is the reason we have uh, i mean non uniform stress distribution in the vertical leg and for that, that wherever we have shear shear flow shear, shear lag concept the, uh, the 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 wherever we have shear lag concept i mean shear lag uh, occurring we have non uniform stress distribution so very similar things although this was a case of axial tensile loading and what we are discussing over here is the case of pledged loading but the concept is same uh, you know the this flange is i mean connected to the rest of the beam with the help of this interface area and we are able to transfer the forces to this to this uh, flange only with the help of this connection where shear stresses are being produced so just imagine if you try to push this flange in this direction the only reaction that can develop is at this interface where shear flow are forces are being developed so and as a result then we have the transverse compression and transverse tension acting also you know this the areas far from the web are then lightly stressed and the areas at near the web are more highly stressed these lines as you see over here are showing the part of the cross section acting in the uh, 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 part of the cross section that that is i mean contributing to the uh, uh, to the uh, resisting of forces over over here no stress and over here all, throughout width we have stresses so this is in fact happening with, with the help of some transition i mean so so over here some some part of the area is, is i mean uh, active in resisting loads and then over here we have some more area until we reach this point so the complete area starts acting st complete width starts acting load but with the help with the with the difference that more stress is acting on the on the side near the connection and away from connection we have lesser intensity of stress so uh, this concept i wanted to revise this concept because this is how uh, the same concept applies when we're considering the T-beams. Uh, the actual distribution is, I mean, like, this is how the actual stresses are distributed on the, uh, on the flange of, of the beams, on the, on the slab, actually. Higher stresses near the flange, near the web, and as you go away from the web, it decreases. But, you know, this makes the calculation a bit uh, difficult, uh, I mean, lengthy, if you consider the actual uh, distribution of stresses on the flanges what we do instead in design and analysis is we consider only a part of the of the of the flange effective so we call it effective flange width be so on that we apply a uniform stress of 0.85 fc prime i mean we consider a uniform stress 
acting on a lesser weight instead of taking this distribution acting on the complete width. So instead of taking center to center, we are considering a certain effective depth. Now, what should be the exact value for this effective uh, effective width? Sorry, I'm not saying, I was saying effective depth. Effective width. So how much effective width should be considered? This is given by the ACI code. Let me show you the equations. Uh, before we go to the equations, let me uh, sh let me show you some of the symbols that we are using in this equation. This BW represents the width of the web and we have another width called as BE, effective width of the compression flange. So uh, BE, uh, BE, now we have BE in this case also, this is how BE will be represented. So BE is basically, you know, BW plus some projection beyond BW, some distance beyond BW. So we will see how we calculate it, but yes, you know that this is H, the entire, the, the, the total depth of the beam, and then you know about D, this D is effective depth of the beam, uh, the same things that you have already learned, this is of course the compression phase, this, this for where the reference is for H and D is the compression phase, uh, HF will be thickness of flange, F for flange, so H, this is in fact thickness of the slab, so uh, let me now show you the equations. These are the equations for BE. It is the least value of these three for this is the this is the BE for interior beam and this is BE for the spandrel beam. So if you see it is the least value out of these three. What is SW over here? SW is the clear transverse span between web. This is a web, this is another adjacent web. So the clear transverse span or should, should I say clear distance between webs is SW. And what is LN? LN is not shown in this. LN is not shown in this figure. I mean, you can't see LN in this figure because it's a cross-sectional view. LN is perpendicular to this. So LN is clear length of beam span. This is, I mean, in the longitudinal direction. You can't see in, the, in, the long, in this figure. Uh, so any other symbol over here? We, I think we have discussed all of those symbols. So this is the least value of these, uh, these three for the interior beam and the least of these three for the edge beam. So uh, this is how you can see we can, uh, you can, you can see slight differences also. We have over here 8 HF, this projection is 8 HF. So 8 HF becomes 2 times HF. Similarly, this is SW by 2, SW by 2. So if it is same SW on this side and as well as on this side, so this becomes 2 times SW by 2. Uh, are the total transverse span so this complete answer becomes equal to total transverse span and then we have ln by 8 for this side and similarly ln by 8 for this side one eighth of the clear span for the beam and over here we have one twelfth of the clear span uh, this projection and then six times hf instead of eight eight times hf and then again sw by 2 because we have now only on one side we have the flange so uh, in all these situations keep in mind the compression is on the flange side compression is on the flange side so we are talking about positive bending moment cross sections in all these cases uh, keep in mind we, this these provisions apply to apply to a beam which is part of the slab I mean, these provisions apply to uh, to the case when the T-beam is because of some part where we have a T-beam action because some, some part of the slab is acting integrally with the web. So this is, so these provisions apply to sections which are part of a continuous floor system, all right, which are part of a continuous floor system. So uh, there are separate provisions if you have isolated T-beam, isolated T-beam. Uh, for isolated T-beams, uh, just as you see in this figure, all of these are, uh, these seem to be pre-stressed, but right now our definition is about non-pre-stressed T-beams. Uh, for isolated T-beams, usually these tend to be pre-stressed, but uh, we are talking right now about non-pre-stressed T-beams. For uh, isolated T-beams like these, the provisions of ACI are uh, 
for isolated T beams, ACI section 6.3.2.2 says uh, these provisions should be satisfied. The flange thickness that you provide, the flange thickness, this thickness that you provide should be at least equal to half of this width, half of web width BW. And the second provision is that this effective uh, width is equal to the actual width but if actual weight exceeds 4 BW, you will take it equal to 4 BW. So, this is how these two provisions are to be satisfied for the isolated T beams. Our discussion uh, will be, um, I mean, we can discuss either isolated, we will also be, we will be mainly discussing the T beam section in continuous floor systems, but we can also have a look at isolated T beam section. The procedure for both is same just the, the the provisions regarding effective width and uh, this flange thickness are different. So apart from this, the rest of the process is same. Um, so we will see both of them. Next we discuss reinforcement in the transverse direction. You know, just try to be clear about the longitudinal and transverse direction. So if you are designing this girder, this is the longitudinal direction and this is transverse direction for this girder. If you are designing this beam, then this is the longitudinal direction. This will be the, we will have longitudinal reinforcement in this direction. And this is the transverse direction. So it depends on the beam. Uh, so for each beam, we have a longitudinal direction and we have transverse direction. Now, uh, we're going to discuss a reinforcement in the transverse direction not in the longitudinal direction that we will be discussing when we will be design when we will discuss the design of such beams but right now we are just talking about reinforcement in the transverse direction so for example if you are considering this beam you want to you are you are looking at this beam you want to uh, design this beam the longitudinal uh, the longitudinal reinforcement in this beam will be designed based on you know moments acting in the longitudinal direction so uh, th there's a different topic if you consider this direction, transverse direction. Now, any loading applied directly over this flange part of the beam will cause bending moment, negative bending moment at this location. Similarly, if you consider, uh, I mean, uh, this girder, if the load applied over this flange will be kind of acting as somewhat like a cantilever, not exactly a cantilever, but uh, will be will be trending like you see this flange is being supported by the web so this is a kind of support for the flange and any load applied on this will be uh, trying to produce negative bending moment at this interface interface of flange and the web same goes even in case of uh, an isolated t-beam if this was an isolated t-beam although we have shown the this flange is separate over here uh, this figure is the same which we, which we discussed previously, but this time I, I'm using it for a different purpose. Let's consider that this flange is not separate and a part of this beam just as the right flange. So in this case, again, if you consider loading acting directly over this path, over the flange, will be like in case of an isolated beam, this is perfectly a cantilever. This flange will be acting as a cantilever supported on this web so in this case you need to design you need to know bending moment at this interface at this location of the interface of the flange and the web and for those bending moments you need to design the transverse reinforcement in this direction so there are separate provisions for beams which is a part of a continuous floor system and for beams which are isolated so in case of uh, in any case although in uh, although the action is different in both cases, but uh, we consider them. Let's discuss them separately. In case of, in case of a sep in case of isolated T beam, the process is simple. The dead, affected dead and live load acting over here. If you apply that on this flange, and and for that affected dead and live loading, you calculate bending moment over here. And for that moment, you need to design the reinforcement in this direction. Simple. So this, in this case, the, this is uh, simple. In case of a beam which is a part of a continuous floor system, uh, we have two possibilities. One possibility is, for example, if you are designing in this in this figure, this slab is one way. I mean, it is trans transferring load in this direction, one direction. And if you see, when you are designing this T beam, 
then for this T beam, this is the transverse direction. Now, when you will be designing this slab, you will be providing slab in this direction in which it is act, act, actually carrying the load. So the, the, the reinforcement designed for in slab in this direction will actually be present over here also, of course, because the same slab is acting as a flange for this beam. So you don't need to provide any separate, any additional reinforcement in the transverse direction for this beam because we already have designed reinforcement in the slab in this direction because slab flexural reinforcement is in this direction. Main reinforcement is in flexural reinforcement is in this direction. It's, it's, the slab is spanning in this direction. In this case, the slab that is the, the span of the slab, the flexural span of the slab is, you know, perpend is, is you know, uh, parallel to the uh, f to the uh, transverse direction of this uh, beam, but in this case, in case of this girder, in order to design, uh, if you see, the, this slab has reinforcement in this direction, but since it is acting as one-way slab, act transferring load in only in this direction, there is no reinforcement provide designed for this other perpendicular direction. So for this T beam, you need to design, you need to separately provide reinforcement in this transverse direction because the reinforcement of the slab is not going in this direction. It is going in this direction. So you need to provide reinforcement in this flange so that it can carry the negative moment. It can resist the negative moment that would be developed due to loads acting directly over this flange. Now, how should you uh, calculate that affected moment, of course you will, you will be applying affected dead and affected live loading and as far as moment calculation is concerned, ACI code says that you should consider this the effective, you should consider the overhang which is you know the uh, part of BE, you know if, if you remember BE, we have discussed that you know this is BE, we have two overhangs on both sides, two projections on both sides. So the, so the ACI code says that apply affected dead and live load over this overhang, over this overhang and calculate bending moment, negative bending moment of course in this case because it will be acting as a cantilever and can cal calculate bending moment assuming that this is a cantilever, alright? So assuming that you have a cantilever and you apply load over here, you calculate bending moment at this location, very simple in this case. It's a cantilever, assume it as a cantilever, this is how code allows you to do it. Next we are going to discuss analysis of flange sections in positive bending. Uh, we will be using Whitney stress block model concept. Uh, just to recall, we had, we had applied this, we had derived initially that Whitney stress block for a rectangular beam. Uh, in which the compression zone was a constant width compression zone. You see, this was a constant width, and we developed this concept, Whitney stress block. Now, in our case, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that the depth of neutral, that the depth of equivalent rectangular stress block, the depth of Whitney stress block A, is less than HF, and the second possibility is that. The depth of neutral exit, the depth of a rectangular stress block A is greater than HF. Now let's discuss them separately. But before we go into that discussion, uh, in fact, there is no problem over here because in this case, if A if A happens to be lesser than HF thickness of this flange, then you see the compression zone will again have a uniform width. This time with B E. So there is no problem in applying. Uh, in applying this uh, concept, the Whitney stress block concept, when the uh, when the compression zone is a constant width, but uh, but in the second case, if the A value is less is greater than HF, so now we have two widths for the compression zone. One is this BE for the flange, and this, and then the second width is BW, smaller width BW uh, for for some part of the web. So. How should we work around this problem? Uh, you may feel that this would be inoperable. The, 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 the concept of witness stress block would be inappropriate, inappropriate for, these, for the second case in which A is greater than HF. 
um, particularly the largest error would be produced if C exceeds HF but A happens to be lesser than HF. So the, the actual neutral axis lies below weight, below the flange, into the web, but A value happens to fall within the flange. So that would be the largest error that you can expect from this model. But even in this case, even the largest uh, error situation case, the witness stress block gives sufficiently accurate result for analysis and design and we will be using this concept in both cases. Uh, so the analysis of flange sections in positive bending, we are discussing it only for positive bending. Why? Because in only in case of positive bending, the section will be in sagging and the, the top of the beam will be in compression. So the flange will be in compression only if there is a positive bending. In case there is a negative bending, then the flange will be in tension and compression zone will be on this side and naturally then in that case, the, the depth of the, the width will be a constant width. This will be naturally a constant width compression zone in case of negative bending. So in case of positive bending, two possibilities. One possibility is that the depth of neutral length, the, the equivalent rectangular stress block depth A is less than HF, case number one. And second case is that A, it, A is greater than HF. The second case is quite rare in uh, practical beams but we will cover it for, for completion, for uh, uh, completing this course. Uh, so the process, so, so based on this, we have two cases, case one and case two. So, if, uh, uh, so we will be starting with case one. We will be assuming that we have case one. In, we will be assuming that A is lesser than HF. The equivalent rectangular stress block lies completely in the flank. We will be this will be our assumption because this is the most common case and we will switch to case 2 only if this assumption happens to be false. So uh, if this assumption that A is less than HF equal to or less than HF is true, then in that case the compression zone will be a, const will be a rectangular compression zone, it will be a constant width compression zone so, and the procedure that we have discussed for rectangular cross sections will apply. So this procedure which we have discussed for rectangular cross sections will apply. So you will be just making sure that your assumption of case one is, is true and the rest of the process is exactly the same as we have discussed for rectangular beams. Uh, so uh, let, let's have a quick recap of that procedure. So as usual we will assume uh, uh, that I mean we will assume that this is the case one and that means we will assume that A which is equal to beta 1 C is equal to or lesser than HF. So we will assume it is case one and then next we will assume epsilon S equal to or greater than epsilon Y. We will assume that the tension steel is yielding and from section equilibrium we will be using uh, the already derived equations for A except that this time B is replaced by BE because now compression zone has a width of BE not B. And once you have your A value, you can, ch you can check your assumption at step number one. Compare this A value with HF. If it is really equal to or less than HF, uh, go to, I mean, uh, continue. Uh, your assumption is correct. If not, stop here and go to case number two. Uh, so let's assume that A is really lesser than or equal to HF. And then the next step would be that you will be, based on this A value, you can confirm that epsilon s should be equal to or greater than epsilon y. Usually this is true. Uh, so next you will be, next you can simply calculate mn from this equation. a is fy into d minus a by 2. So very simple. Now if this answer a uh, is not lesser than hf, then you have to go to case 2. In that case, your A value will be greater than HF and this, this is how you will proceed now. Your A value is greater than HF and compression zone now consists of two different bits, BE and BW. And in this case, you can see that uh, you will be having certain depth A for which uniform stress of 0.85 FC prime will be acting. And this, as you, this we will again assume that Fs is equal to Fy. We will assume that tension steel is again yielding. We will retain this assumption and of course we are going to check it later on. 
So in this case, we will artificially divide the cross section into two parts. In first part, we will consider only the overhanging flanges and in the second part, we will only consider the web. So uh, this is just for theoretical, I mean, just for calculation purposes. Uh, and accordingly, we will divide the total area of tension reinforcement into two parts, ASF and ASW. Again, this is just a theoretical uh, imaginary division of AS. There is no such thing practically uh, physically existing ASF and ASW. This is just a theoretical or uh, imaginary division of AS. Uh, we will see how, how what is ASF and what is ASW in the uh, upcoming discussion. Uh, so we calculate the total C force as uh, sum of C force contributed by this the overhanging flanges represented by CCF and the C force contributed by this part of the web CCW. So we calculate them uh, in a manner like this because now we have a uniform stress distribution up to this total left A. So of course uh, the up the, these these overhanging flanges are subjected to a uniform stress distribution of 0.85 FC prime. So in order to calculate CCF, CCF will be equal to, let me just change this color. This CCF will be given by, you now the stress is 0 0.85 FC prime constant stress and the area on which it is acting is in fact consisting of uh, two parts, but I can write it down like this. That area has a width of, you know, BE, it has a width of BE minus BW, all right, BE minus BW is the width of the area on which it is acting, BE minus BW and the other dimension is HF, so this is CCF and accordingly we can calculate CCW in the usual manner, CCW equal to again 0.85 FC prime is the stress acting over this area and that area is this time again one dimension is A or you can say beta 1 C so whatever you like into BW so BW constant width multiplied by A or beta 1 C so this is the area on which it is acting so, so we, can, we can calculate CCF and CCW now as far as CCF is concerned everything in is known on this side. So we can easily calculate CCF. As far as CCW is concerned, the only unknown is A. Uh, we can find this A again by enforcing section equilibrium, which is, uh, no, you know, T will be equal to ASFY, all right, T will be equal to ASFY, and compression force is now contributed by, uh, let me write it down from basics. You can write for equilibrium, T is equal to A, sorry, T has to be equal to C, and in this case, C is sum of CCF plus CCW, and we have just written the equations for these two, and we have assumed that tension steel is yielding, so ASFY is equal to 0 0.85 FC prime BE minus BW into HF plus Again, 0 0.85 FC prime into BW into A. Now, A is the only unknown that you need to know in this equation. So, A is something that you can calculate from this expression. And based on, uh, you know, you can write down that equation as this. A would be equal to, you know, uh, A will be equal to this. T minus CCF. This was T and this is actually CCF. So T minus CCF divided by 0 0.85 of C prime BW. Once you know your A value, so next you can calculate, once you know your A value, you can calculate C from this expression, and then from the, using this that C value, you can calculate epsilon S, and then you can confirm your assumption that epsilon S was really equal to or greater than epsilon Y. We have assumed FS equal to FY because we had assumed that epsilon S is equal to or greater than epsilon Y, we are assuming the tension steel is yielding, so if that is confirmed, so your calculations are all right. Just go ahead, calculate the bending mo the moment capacity. Now we have two compressive forces, so we are taking the moments, the tensile steel centroid, the level of D as the moment center. So we are calculating uh, 
uh, one compression force multiplied by sleeve arm plus another compression force multiplied by sleeve arm. So one compression force CCF has a sleeve arm. Look at the application of CCF. Where is it? Act is it acting? Acting at H by two from the top, and this is D. So D minus HF by two. So it will be given as a sleeve arm will be D minus HF by two plus C C W into its lever arm. It has a lever arm of D minus A by 2. So this will give you M N and then you can, uh, so this is the final answer. Uh, in our discussion of flange sections up till now we have assumed that there is no compression reinforcement. Uh, although compression reinforcement in flange sections will have, I mean, very little effect on the their moment capacity but uh, it, its effect can be included using the same procedures. So if it is a case one uh, analysis, if it is case one, then definitely ignore the contribution of flexural, uh, of compression reinforcement. If it is case one, definitely ignore it uh, because, you know, if, if the neutral axis, I mean, if neutral axis is so close to the compression phase uh, that it lies within the flange, then any reinforcement in this region, in the compression uh, compression reinforcement will also be very close to the neutral axis so that will be also having very little stress very little, little, very little strain and accordingly very little stress and you can easily neglect it for case 1 if it is in for case 2 because the neutral axis would be slightly deeper and compression reinforcement will be slightly at a higher level than the, than the, than the, than the uh, neutral axis so in that case, you can consider it using the same procedures that we have discussed for double reinforced beam. Um, I think we don't need to re re revise it, but uh, we can just write down the final equation. That final equation for bending moment would then have three compressive forces. If there is, if in case of, if, if we have, uh, you know, uh, compression reinforcement present as well, and we want to incorporate it, its effect then MN could be given as CCF into D minus HF by 2 as usual and CCW into D minus A by 2. These are the same things and we will have another force coming from compression steel CS and its lever arm D minus D prime. So this is how then we can write down the final equation. Finally, we look at the five value for flange section. The same procedure that we have discussed already applies over here, so I don't need to repeat it. Usually, these are tension control sections, but you can confirm whenever you need to. Uh, and then, lastly, uh, we have already discussed that now we are discussing A is minimum in flange sections. Uh, we are familiar with these equations, we have discussed them for other cases. Uh, the primary question that arises in flange sections is whether we should use. B E or B W over here. Uh, we use B W in all cases except a few, except one case. I'll be discussing that one case, only one case in which we will not be using this B W. Uh, this B W is re reflecting the uh, this the width width of the web. So uh, the only exception exception to this is. That exception is applied when the flange is in tension and the beam is statically determined. Flange in tension and beam statically determined. In that case, this BW is replaced by, you know, this BW will be replaced by larger of, you know, so then BW is replaced by larger of 2 times BW and BE, whichever is larger, we use that over here instead of this actual width of the web. So we either use 2 times BW or BE, whichever is larger. So this is only in this special case, flange intention and beam is statically determined. All other cases, we will be using BW as this width of the web. All right. So all other cases include flange in compression. If flange is in compression, definitely use BW. Uh, the reason for this is, you know, when, when flange is in compression, tension is on this side, 
So uh, when tension is on this side, the flexural tension cracking will be I mean, appearing on this side and naturally you should consider this as BW. In case of uh, uh, when, when, flange is in, uh, when flange is in tension, uh, but if the beam is, if the flange is in tension, then flexural cracks will appear on this side. Uh, then you can, you could expect that we will be using BE instead of BW. But the code recommends still using BW based on experience. And uh, for a situation where the beam is, uh, you know, this this flange is in tension, but the beam, if the beam is a part of uh, of, a, of a continuous floor system, or if in any case, the beam is statically indeterminate. You will be using BW uh, as this BW as a, as 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 this value this width. But in very special case, if the flange is in tension and the beam is statically determinate, just as you see over here, flange in tension. But if this beam needs to be statically determinate for this to be applied, for this uh, BE to be replaced by larger of two times BW and BE. So generally, we use. I mean, uh, uh, in case of a in case of a beam which is a part of a floor system, it is of course almost all the times a continuous uh, continuous beam. So in that case, usually we'll see that B BW is the width of the web that we'll be using over here in this expression. So this is the discussion of A is minimum, and now we're ready to discuss the uh, some of the medical problems.